Let's pray again. Lord, we praise you that uh, those wounds and that which was accomplished through those wounds declare our freedom, forgiveness, and deliverance from death and eternal torment, from eternal separation. Because your son stood in our place. Taking our iniquity upon himself, taking our sin upon himself, as you, Father, unleashed your wrath upon him as though he committed every sin of every sinner that would ever come to believe, and in turn granting us on our account, his very righteousness so that we can sing such a song, so that we can be assured of the salvation that was purchased upon, purchased on that day on our account. Lord, may the words that we study now as we continue to worship by declaring your truth um, resonate deep within Um, to show us um, the depths of your love for us, your bride, your church. And for anyone here who stands at a distance from you, who is not saved by grace through faith alone and your son alone, we pray that today would be the day that you would birth within them the ability to believe and to receive the gospel of your son, the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, good morning. And welcome, and to continue in the worship of our Lord, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you're not familiar with the Bible, all the T's are together, so if you make it to 1st or 2nd Timothy, just turn back and you'll make it to 2 Thessalonians. We want to look together this morning at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. But I want to go ahead and read through verse 17. The Word of God reads, verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord. Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm. And hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Well, we have just completed... Um, a study in the Sermon on the Mount. Took a number of months and studied Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And in studying about the kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, in studying about our king of the kingdom, I've been thinking a lot about the church, obviously. For the only ones in the kingdom are those who are part of the church. And reflecting on this, I was brought back to Matthew chapter 16, which happened to be our Sunday school lesson for this morning. And uh, the uh, Caesarea Philippi confession of Peter speaking on behalf of the apostles, on behalf of the disciples, that uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the only hope that anyone has in this life. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against her. 
which is to say that his church is the only institution that he promised to build and bless. His church. So before I explain the text, I want to raise a couple questions. Number one, how important is the church to the church? Are we passionate about the church? Are you passionate about the church? Now, in order for us to know how important the church should be to us, uh, we simply have to raise the question, how important is the church to Jesus Christ? Well, we read in Matthew 16, as I said, that he builds it. He blesses it. He refers to her as his bride, as his body, as his flock, as his special people, as the household of God, as the family of God, as a chosen people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, new creatures in Christ, the new man, the very temple of God, and the very pillar and foundation of the truth. You want truth? You go to a church that declares the whole counsel of God. Period. Truth is not relative. Truth is very narrow. For Jesus said, narrow is the way. (laughs) Difficult is the way. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. There are many people who go in that way. But straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And there are very few who go therein by. Now, by those definitions alone, passion for the church is something that is distinctly and unmistakably Christian. So how then important is the church to you this morning? How important should the church be in the life of the Christian? Now, there are two erroneous extremes in our day and in our culture. In one is by way of the Roman Catholic Church, um, administered by the hierarchy of priests, bishops, and popes who claim to have total power and authority over the church where hope is believed to be found within that organization alone. That's one erroneous view. On the other hand is the contemporary American evangelistic mindset, American evangelicalism, Um, characterized oftentimes by its excessive subjectivity, by its individuality, Um, a view that restricts Christianity to a quote-unquote personal faith where church is viewed as a kind of voluntary society. Oftentimes you'll hear them say that you don't have to attend church to be a Christian. Well, to be in Christ, to be a Christian, you have to be in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you want to be where the word of truth is taught and you want to be with those who are also saved by Christ. (laughs) At best, their association to the body, many of them, is sitting in front of a television or a uh, computer screen, uh, gathering together in front of an inanimate object where the church is gathering via. Uh, a streamlined type of um, service where you can sit in your robe and slippers. But those two views um, happen to dominate the American church scene. And both of those views are not only distorted, but beloved, they're unbiblical. They're simply unbiblical. Now, passion for the church should be a common expression of the church. The bride of Christ. I mean, after all, that is the spirit of the apostles all throughout the epistles, is it not? And the reason that it's the heart of the apostles is because it's the heart of their Lord. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It's a guarantee. Now, for the next few weeks, beloved, I want to look at the passion and purpose of the church, the church, Christ's church, and then we'll delve into a study of the book of Romans after that. So do we share a passion for the church of Jesus Christ? Do we understand our purpose within the church of Jesus Christ? Now, certain Christians who who lack love for the church may not be um, insightfully aware of Christ's own love for his bride. So we want to try to straighten some of that out today. 
So naturally, those who do love the Lord will grow or they must grow to love what he loves. Amen? We want to love what he loves, and he loves his church. He loves the bride. He loves dirty sinners saved by his abounding grace. That's who he loves. Wretched made righteous. Dirty made clean, made pure, made holy. That's who he loves. That's what's precious in his sight. So my hope is that the church will be just as precious in our sight. With all of our faults, with all of our errors, with all of our sin, uh, with all of our irritating personality quirks, that we will love the bride as he loves the bride. Jesus said, after all, the world will recognize that you belong to me by the what? The love you have for who? Not for him, but for one another. Because the love that you have for one another reflects the love that you have for me and what I love, and I love my bride. 1 Corinthians 13 says that if we lack to love one another, we have nothing. Regardless of how gifted one is, regardless of how gifted we are corporately, we, if we lack love, we have nothing. I mean, this is one of the reasons we gather. Did you know that? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 says this. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and what? And good works, not neglecting to meet together. I pose the question, is that why you're here today, beloved? To stir one another up in love and good works. We exist to build one another up in love and good works. We exist to proclaim the gospel. We exist to exemplify Christ's likeness, and that is to demonstrate Christian love. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, this call to love one another here is grounded in their conversion. That's what, what Peter's declaring here. And when we get to 1 John 4, 7, that, that text tells us that love for the body of Christ is one of the evidences that one has truly been born again. So then Christian fellowship, our life together, is a priority. It's a priority that we be together. Now, many folks make many excuses today in our time and in our day with all the difficulties and demands on our life. Uh, perhaps a long commute um, in order to get to church is one ex excuse. Um, demanding jobs, um, um, educating our children, and simply raising our children is tough work. But, beloved, if we allow ourselves to become victims of the normal struggles and challenges uh, of life, we will fail to carry out our mission and our responsibility as members of the household of faith. We will not fulfill it by accident. <laughs> It's impossible. So an intentional effort must be made or we will remain steeped in immaturity. So why then is attendance, participation, and our mission within the body of Christ so important? Quite simply, beloved, because it is out of love. And our love is simply, once again, a reflection of his love for us, and that will be our focus this morning, the love of Christ for his bride, the love of Christ for his church. And to understand the love of Christ for you this morning, we have to focus in on our position as a church. Before we get to our mission next week, we must focus on our position. And once we understand our position and the depth of which Christ has gone to save us and to love us and to manifest that love, that ought to be the springboard for us in loving the bride, in loving what he loves. So let's look at our position, shall we? Second Thessalonians 2. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you, through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
That is the doctrine of soteriology in a nutshell. That, beloved, in those two verses, really, overall, is a picture of the entire doctrine of salvation, if you really want to get down to it. There's another, other aspects attached to it, but that's the heart and soul of it right there. Your salvation. Now, before we get into this for application's sake today, I want, we, we have to understand what was going on in the context. Very important. So now we're going to move from that introduction to laying out the context of why Paul, Paul wrote this letter, and then we're going to go to the application of this truth to our lives in context to loving one another. Amen? Are you with me? Okay. Now, when Paul wrote his first letter to the Thessalonians, he was writing to a church in the infant stages of their faith. He wrote to them because they were confused and they had many concerns. They were mainly concerned with what happens when a loved one who's in Christ dies because they were recognizing that, hey, they're not being immediately resurrected, and they knew that resurrection was part of the gospel, physical resurrection. So Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, and he communicates to them that the resurrection has to do with the second coming of Christ. So... Fret not, he says, little fretlings. Your loved ones are with the Lord. The physical resurrection takes place later. So he talks with them concerning the great day of the Lord, the great day of judgment. That's the letter of 1 Thessalonians, and that's the question that he's answering. Now, the church of Thessalonica receives that first letter and seemingly misunderstands some of the things that the apostle is trying to say. This should encourage you. This should encourage us. There are certain things we don't understand. It's always been that way. That's why Paul says, that's why Peter says continuously, I do not cease to remind you of these things. That's what preachers do. They remind you of these things. Today, you're going to be reminded of who you are in Christ, how he sees you, the lengths at which he went to save you. Now, if we had a little bit of Pentecostalism in us, (laughs) which I'm kind of glad we don't, however, just a little bit is good because we should get charged up over that. Amen. A couple amens. But look, look what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's what he's already addressed in the first letter. And he says, our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. Many heresies, many fallacies, many false teachers. Don't trip out. Remember what we have instructed you with regard to the coming of the Lord, with regard to the resurrection, with regard to the glorious hope of glory, the finish line of salvation. Because this church was under heavy persecution. He commended them of their love for one another, by the way, as they were under persecution. And that's what persecution will do. It will knit the church together like this. Bickering will stop when there's persecution. (laughs) Because you embrace one another in Christ. That's the beauty of persecution all throughout redemptive history. But still, there's confusion in their minds. This time, they're worried that the day of the Lord may have passed them by. They're worried that Christ may have come and they missed it. So he writes this second letter. Paul says, dear church, you're misunderstanding something once again. The day of the Lord has not happened, and I want you to know that a few things have to happen before the day of the Lord arrives. He talks about the man of lawlessness being revealed in verse 3. He says in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And verse 10, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to believe the truth of Christ and be saved. They refuse it. That's another sign. It was happening then and it's happening today, beloved. 
Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in their unrighteousness. They love to reject Christ. They love to do that which is contrary to Christ. He says, don't worry, the day of the Lord hasn't come, beloved. So he uses language here of being shaken, shaken in mind, shaken and alarmed. He's writing to a a people who are experiencing a kind of spiritual earthquake. We live in Southern California. We know the uneasiness of an earthquake, amen? When the walls start shaking and the pots and pans start clanging, there's there's a sense of hopelessness there, right? You're shaken, you don't know what to do. You go stand under a doorway. That's what they say to do. Now they say that's not the right thing to do, so you don't know what to do. Because <laughs> you have no control. That's the point. You know, or get under a table in school. That's a good idea. So here, the spiritual stability of the church has been shaken. So he, he writes to them wanting to calm them down. He wants to bring stability to their instability. He wants to bring confidence to their fear. So you know what he does? That's the context and background. You know what he does? He takes them back to their position in Christ. Their position, their eternally secure position in Christ. That's where he takes them. Now, you can imagine what they felt like by the end of verse 12, (laughs) before verse 13. Man of lawlessness, a great deception, a great falling away. Great. He takes them back. And he calls them to stand firm. Notice in verse 15. You see, beloved, if we ever want to grasp a love and passion for the church, we must not forget, as once again, as as I've said thus far this morning on two occasions, we cannot forget to understand the length at which Christ has gone to save us as his church. So, not unlike Paul, in order to understand this reality, I want to take back I want to take you back to your position in Christ this morning. Okay, so there's the background, there's the context. Now we want to look at the application to our lives. Now, the position of security that we have in Christ is because of his unconditional love for us, for those that are in Christ. And that that ought to be the springboard of our love for what he loves, that is his bride. So their position, the Thessalonians' position, our position as a church, your position in Christ individually is displayed in a beautiful benediction that we find in verses 13 and 14. And that's what we want to look at this morning. And the benediction comes with this, the beautiful conjunction. That is the word but. 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 We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved of the Lord. Okay, to be beloved of the Lord is for the Lord to beset his love, his salvific love on sinners. This isn't the common love of God that he has for all creation and all those who are made and created in his image, but this is a salvific love. This is a distinct kind of love. This is a 1 John 3 verse 1 love. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. That means saved children of God. Not created children, but recreated children in God through Christ. Behold that kind of love, beloved of the Lord. Then he continues. Because God chose you as the first fruits. First fruits meaning from the beginning. From before the beginning, as we shall see. To be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here then is the love of God in Christ put on display for all those who are in Christ by faith alone. Are you with me, beloved? Now, this church, the church of Thessalonica, is not unlike any other true church. It is made up of a very diverse group of people with differing backgrounds, different kinds of upbringings, not unlike this room right here, right now. 
each one of their individual lives together would have made up, as the church does today, a matchless mosaic. Think about those little tile mosaics, just individual tiles all put together. Put them together and scrounge them out. It looks like a mess. Put them together and it becomes this great grand picture. That's a picture of the church. All kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of upbringings, all kinds of um, ethnic heritages make up the one true body of Christ. But when it comes to the spiritual biography of this church in Thessalonica or this church in San Diego, our identity is identical. It's the same. So Paul could speak to them in a very collective way. And he says, each one of you is guaranteed all of the epics, all of the parts of salvation. And here they are. Number one, it's election. Number two, it's justification. Number three, is sanctification. And number four, is the promise of glorification. That's your outline. That's what he's talking about right here in front of you this morning. Now, in the case of every individual person who belongs to God in Christ, glorification is the culmination of his redemptive purposes for his redeemed. Sinner saved by grace. Glory is the hope of salvation. That's the finish line. The promise of glory is the reason that it all began in the first place. Now, there was many concerns in the minds of these believers on this day. So Paul provides this biographical description of their eternal position in Christ Jesus, reminding them of the eternal authorship of Almighty God over not only their individual lives, but their corporate life as a body, okay? He says, in effect, you don't have to worry. There's a process underway, and God is in control of it all. And it all begins, he says, with election, where God from the beginning chose you. Do you know that? Do you believe that? See, if you don't believe that, you're saved here this morning, if you don't believe that, you have a serious problem with the text. This is the depth of love for with which he loves you. That before he created anything, he chose to save you. That's why we read from Ephesians 1 this morning. And I think this is the question that Paul would want to ask us this morning. The first way that God's choice brings stability to our faith is that God's choice expresses his unconditional, predetermined love for his bride. No conditions. He chose to beset his love upon you. He chose you. That's a mystery in and of itself. You can say, why on earth would he choose me? That is the mystery of God, within the mind of God, for his sovereign purposes unknown to us. You just rejoice in it because it's biblical. This is the part, the first primary part of salvation. And when did, you, when did this choosing take place? From the beginning. Titus 1 tells us that God made this plan before the beginning of time. Titus 1.1, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before what? Before time began. He invented time because he exists outside of time and he exists outside of space. He called time into order. 2 Timothy 1.9 says the same thing. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, it's nothing you've done, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from what? From all eternity. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8, it says that the names of believers were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Before he spoke anything into existence, your name was in the book. All who were in Christ, your name was in the book. But I didn't come to faith until I was 68 years old. Your name was in the book. I came to faith. I grew up in the household of faith, and I don't even remember when I was converted, but I know I've always believed your name was in the book. Predetermined. 
That's love. That's how much he loves his church. When no creation existed, no angels existed, no universe existed, no human being existed, the triune God determined by way of the Father to gift his Son with a loved gift, a love gift to the Son by the Father. That's why John 6 says this. This is the words of Jesus. All that the Father gives me will, emphatic, will come to me. That's why in the same chapter, in verse 44, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Draw is a word in the Greek that means drag. And in verse 65, no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by my Father. That's love. That's the love with which he loved you to choose you in eternity past, an expression of perfect love, the Father was determined to give the Son a redeemed gift of humanity. You choose people to be your friend, amen? You have that freedom? You choose who you want to hang out with and who you do not want to hang out with. And when you choose someone to be your friend, when you choose to date someone, when you choose to marry someone, you're saying something with your choice. I want to be with you. I want to be connected to you. I want to love you. I want a relationship with you. I want to be united to you. I want to be friends with you. You choose to be a friend. You choose not to associate with others. You're expressing a sense of care and a sense of love for that individual by way of your choice. Aren't you glad that your faith isn't dependent upon your choice? Huh? Think about it. You, you can be just as flippant as any other historic Christian. Back and forth, wait, back and forth, back and forth. Is this really true? Are you not grateful that it's his choice and not yours when you lay on your bed at night and go, man, is this whole gospel thing true? Is Jesus really true? Is he the only way? I mean, man, it's narrow. Aren't you glad that it's his choice and not yours? If dementia ever sets in, if I ever lose my mind and I start saying some wacko stupid things, contrary to the truth I know, I praise God it's his choice and not mine. He holds me in his hand. I don't hold him in mine. No one will snatch you from my father's hand, Jesus said. I chose you. I hold you. I paid for you. That's love. That's the gospel. Eternity past. If you don't like the word chosen, I'm sorry. The word chosen, if you look it up in your Greek concordance, just, it simply means this, to select, select out for oneself. That's what it means. That's love. Now, the other thing that God's choice communicates to us, in addition to his love, is that it communicates commitment. He was committed and determined to come for those he chose before time began. When you make a choice, you're saying, I'm committed to this person. When you leave this parking lot, you're going to commit to either turning right or left. Okay? Once you make the commitment, you're into the turn, you're committed. You're committed. When God chose us, he says yes to us. He committed himself to us. He focuses on us. He focuses on you. He's been focused on you ever since he wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life in eternity past. That's how long he's been focused on you. But I didn't come to faith until later. He determined it to be so. That on that day, you would be called, as we shall see in just a moment. Paul says to this church, this is a stabilizing reality to your faith, Church of Thessalonica. This is a stabilizing reality to your faith, Pacific Hope Church. This is how much he loves the bride. So Paul wrote, God has chosen you from the beginning. That's election. Okay, but he chose you for what? What did he choose you for? Notice, for salvation. Chose you in eternity past for salvation. That's known as justification. He was determined to justify you, to make you right, to declare you free from all blame. Once born into this world as a sinful human being, his elect must hear the gospel message. 
they must hear it along with the effectual work of God the Holy Spirit within. So you hear it, you may have heard it many times and rejected it, but that day that you heard it and it transformed your heart and you embraced that truth, that's known as the effectual call. It had an effect on that day in that moment to transform you. And from that moment on, you have been declared righteous. Is it because you earned it? I assure you it's not because you earned anything. Justification is a legal term. It declares you holy. It declares you acceptable before God. Because you and I in our filthy rags will never, nor could we ever, stand before a holy, righteous God, for he is a consuming fire. You have to be made right. So, humanly speaking, not one of us is qualified to stand before God. For the scripture says, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So, at some point, in order that God's plan founded in election can come to glorification, that's heaven, God has to get down with dealing with the issue of sin. You just don't declare someone being righteous. Sin still has to be dealt with. Your sin had to be judged. How? How did God allow for this? That's the question. Because sin has to be punished because God is holy and God is just. Well, it's quite simple, beloved. He punished Jesus in your place. This is the great miracle of the Christian faith. The fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah 53 verse 7, like a lamb that is led to a slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, the son, putting him to grief to render himself as a guilt offering for the redeemed. Jesus died on a cross, executed by who? Roman soldiers, you might say, the Pharisees, the scribes, only indirectly, beloved. He was executed by God the Father. That's the gospel. You take out the cross, you take out the wrath of God that was poured out upon Jesus, you have no gospel. You have no salvation, you have no truth. Jesus bore the wrath of the Father as though he committed every sin of every single sinner that will ever come to believe. If you understand that, you understand the, the core of the Christian gospel. He died in our place. But before laying down his life, he had to live the perfect life before the Father. He had to uphold the law perfectly. That's why he lived for 33 years. executed. God the Father executed Jesus as though he lived your life so he could treat you as though you lived his. That's why he chose you, to justify you. This is the doctrine of substitution. The substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ in your place, church. That's love. See how much he loves the church? See how much he loves his bride? <laughs> There was a day in the life of every believer when God in his grace moved his elective purposes one step further into justification where we heard the gospel and we believed the gospel and we embraced him in response by faith. Well, I chose to embrace Jesus. That's right. But let me tell you something. You know who worked up the choosing in you? The one who chose you. The one who chose you worked up in you the ability to choose him in response to him choosing you. It's either all God or it's not all God, period. If it's part us, then you can boast. Because I could ask you, why does Cousin Bobby not believe? Well, because he hasn't responded like I have. When it was presented to me, I responded. Bobby hasn't. By the grace of God, you responded. You were justified made holy. That's the love for which he loves his church. That is his passion for his church. Do you love the church? Do you love his bride? 
Do you love one another? That's the position in which the church stands. They're made righteous. Never to be condemned. Never to be accused by God for any sin. Jesus bore it all. Now there's another step unfolding in all of this. In election, he chose you for salvation, justifying you by the work of the Holy Spirit within you, making Jesus our righteous standing before the Father. And now at this point, we would think that we could just sit back in this confidence and just relax. Amen? Not the case. The third great step in the life of the believer is what's known as sanctification. And that is his setting us apart unto holiness. Now, he's already made us holy positionally in Christ Jesus. Now he sanctifies us. He sets us apart unto himself. And there's a process as we live down here in that he is working in us to make us more like Christ, practically speaking. Although we already are completely positionally speaking. He loves us that much not to leave us alone. You know, we're used to hearing saved by faith. Saved by Christ, saved by grace. But notice here, he says, saved through sanctification. Saved through sanctification. So how does this sanctification thing work? Paul says two things, quite simply. By the Spirit and belief in the truth by the Spirit. By the Spirit and belief in the truth. Again, by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You know, Paul's not saying here that there's two thoughts on sanctification or that there's two paths on sanctification. You can take the Spirit path if you want, or you can take the truth path if you want. That's not what he's saying. You know, which are you more comfortable with? You know, which fits your theological fancy? He's not saying that. It's very clear. By the Spirit and belief in the truth. In other words, we're engaged in this. These are more like two ingredients that are combined in your soul to bring about growth in holiness as we move towards glorification. He's making you what he wants you to be. You're here this morning, right? Because of the the, the, the glorious work of sanctification, you have a hunger for the truth. You want to be engaged with the Spirit of God and the truth of God. We pray, Lord, we pray to the Spirit, may you open my eyes to understand this truth. Here's this weakness of mine. Lord, I'm tired of this. I'm weary of this. We're engaged in union and communion with the Holy Spirit, and we have the Word of God for way of direction and obedience. Because we, what? Because we can as we can. So sanctification comes by the Spirit and belief in the truth as these two come together. So what is Paul saying here? How is it that we're saved through sanctification? Well, the life that we now live in this world is a life that is given over to the pursuit of holiness as we ascend towards glory. We long for holiness, do we not? Now, as a Christian, we want to be holy because he is holy. That's a desire of us. Do we fail on that on any given day? Yes, but do we stop pursuing? No, we do not, because the Spirit of God is in us, charging us, taking us back to his truth. So it's the Spirit of God and the truth of his word combined together within the believer. This brings to mind Romans 8, all these glorious connecting points of salvation that God has predestined us, he's chosen us, called us for justification as well as Sanctification. Past, present, and future aspects of salvation. Justification, sanctification, future glorification. This is how much he loves his church. Verse 14, notice. To this, he says, he called you through the gospel. Okay, there's the calling. There's not just a comfort in God's choice, but a calling that arises out of God's choice for those that he's determined to save. So this means you have to know something about salvation. We grow to learn about this glorious doctrine, this glorious truth. We learn what he's called us to do and called us to be. Because of what he deems us to be. And that is what? Holy. That's love. 
Notice how he describes it, verse 14. To this he called you through the gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. When do we get the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, when you believe, it's promised and guaranteed to you then. But you'll actually receive it when you see him face to face. For when we see him face to face, we will then be what? We'll be made like him. Imagine the day. No more temptation. Right? No more besetting sins. Are you tired of your besetting sins? Are you tired of your weakness? It'll be gone. Because he called you and he determined to save you in eternity past. He chose you. That day he called you, he justified you, he sanctified you, set you apart, is sanctifying you, and there's this promise of glory. To be practically like our Savior. That's, our, that's your position. That's how much he loves his bride. Do you love the bride? The great day of judgment, you will stand. You will stand. You will not fall if you're in Christ. So he called you into eternity past to this justification. He called you to this sanctification. And he calls you to obtain the glory of the Son. That's the promise. The final epic of salvation is glorification, the finish line. That's amazing grace. Verse 13 and 14 is amazing grace. From election to justification, into sanctification, through sanctification, unto glorification. Isn't that beautiful? Remind one another of these things. Stir one another up in love and good works because of these things. Now, this is a very loving church. Even the neighbors have said that, by the way. There's a testimony, by the way. They said you're great neighbors. That's you. They see your love for one another. They recognize it. May we never stop. <laughs> May we see the importance of the gathering together. May we understand the importance of fellowship. We have small groups starting. Fellowships and homes throughout the county, very important. You don't want to just look at me all day, do you? One week after week, one day a week. You need one another. That's the position of the church. And glorification is what you obtain in the end, beloved. That's how much he loves his church. Do you love the church? Are you passionate for his church? Here's a question. Are you part of his church? What you heard today, are you a recipient of this grace? Have you embraced Christ by faith? Do you believe that there's other paths to God? If you do, you haven't embraced Christ by faith. And if you ask, well, I don't know if I'm chosen, it doesn't matter. If you embrace Christ by faith and repent of your unbelief and repent of your sinful rebellion against him and embrace Christ, it will be revealed in due time, wow, as I read the Bible, he chose me in eternity past and he determined to save me on this date, whatever the date is. What's the date? 21st? 22nd. On the 22nd of January, 2012, he determined to call me, and he gave me ears to hear. Is that you today? I pray that it's you today. If you came in here and it wasn't you, may today be the day. Notice the closing here in verse 15. So then, brothers, stand firm. Where? In what? In this truth, in this reality. Stand firm and hold through the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. What a wonderful balance, right? Standing firm in the truth and moving forward in that truth. That's love and good works. Al Mohler a number of years ago gave a wonderful convocation in this passage, and the title of it was this, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. 
Later, he gave a lecture, lecture just as wonderful entitled, Don't Just Stand There, Do Something. <laughs> they go hand in hand, believer. Right? Our position drives us forward to our mission. And mission begins in the household of faith. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry so that we are no longer swayed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but we're equipped for the ministry. We become a van, e effective ministers of the gospel. Making disciples first. Producing men and women who know how to declare the truth, defend the truth in a lost and dying world. It all ties together. That's how much he loves his bride. So if you have no passion for the church, you likely don't understand Christ's love for the church. And may this message, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, today, tonight, tomorrow, and this week, change that which you have passion for. The bride. The church. Because Jesus loves his church. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that... Um, you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son. And that out of this fallen world, you predetermined to set your love upon the bride for which you would send your son to pay ransom for. That it's only by the shed blood of your son that anyone can be saved. Lord, I pray that we, beginning with me, uh, might respond um, by the grace of your spirit, according to the living word, to love your bride with new, fresh affection. And that everyone in here would love your bride, the church, one another, with also a refreshed affection, knowing that we only love you because you first loved us that our response to loving you would be to love one another, that the world really truly would know that we're yours by the love we have for one another. So, Lord, may we love what you love, hate what you hate, and immerse ourselves in the truth before us. And if anyone, Lord, has difficulty with these glorious doctrines that range from Genesis to Revelation, may you minister to their hearts to embrace these truths as straining on their minds as they may be. May they embrace them by faith knowing that we don't have to understand all things. I can't fathom you placing my name in the Lamb's book before you created anything. I can't fathom that. But Lord, we don't have to fathom that. We accept it by faith. And we entrust ourselves to that which is written by the Spirit within us, declaring truth and the hopeful message of the gospel to those that are lost. We just declare the truth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and ye shall be saved. And it's you who reveals the truth that it was before the foundation of the earth that you chose them. Bless us, Lord, your word to our hearts for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.